Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's live discussion Enabling the Remote Economy, the Role of Financial Technologies. I am Rogilia Stanita, Senior Fintech Investment Advisor at Invest Lithuania and I will be moderating this session. I really hope that every one of you is safe through this pandemic crisis and that you already managed to adapt to new working and living conditions and through it all maintain optimism and healthy spirit. Coronavirus outbreak is now affecting the whole world, not only our health, healthcare systems, but the economy overall. As we're learning to adapt to, uh, to remote work, uh, social distancing, uh, quarantine, many of us wonder how the sector that we're working in will be affected by all this. Fintech is very agile, innovative and technology dependent sector. And we already see a lot of companies successfully adapting to new working conditions. So today we decided to look into this topic and with the help of our guest speakers, try to analyze what role financial technologies could take in the current situation. So today with us, we have three honorable guest speakers. So first of all, we have a representative from Lithuania's central bank, Marius Jurgilas, member of the board of the Bank of Lithuania. Happy to be here. Hello, Marius. Thank you for joining us. Then we have Nigel Verdon, the CEO of Rails Bank and founder of Currency Cloud. Hi there, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Nigel. And finally, we have Leslie Leev, Chief Customer Officer at Revel Systems. Leslie, you're... Thank you so much for having me. It's been an, uh, it's an honor to be here and be a part of the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so, dear listeners, through this session, you have an opportunity to ask questions to our speakers by posting them in Q&A tab that you might see on the bottom of your screens. We'll try to revert to these questions several times during the discussion, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. So, without further ado, I would like to kick off this discussion by asking the first question. So, Marius, as a regulator, you're able to see the broad view of the economy and how financial institutions and fintechs are doing. So, what are the main trends that you notice and how are fintechs coping with the current situation? Once again, uh, thank you, Rogilia, for organizing this panel. And uh, hello, everyone. Once again, my name is Marius Jurgilas. I'm a board member at the Bank of Lithuania. Um, responsible for supervision, uh, financial innovations, and a bit of financial infrastructure. So straight to your question. Well, let, let's be very humble and uh, let's admit that we know as much as we can see from our home. Uh, and we all read the newspapers. So I guess uh, we don't have to state the obvious uh, that we have a very mm, difficult situation. Uh, broadly speaking, and uh, every day we are reassessing. And if I had to summarize it in uh, one sentence, it's uh, we have uh, no idea how bad or how how good it is. It's highly unpredictable. So what does that mean for financial technology firms? Um, it could mean two things. It could mean uh, you know a lot of opportunities, uh, and it also could mean. Uh, a lot of risks. It really depends on what type of uh, business model uh, a particular company is engaged in. Um, if it is uh, financial transactions, uh, you know, just you know, processing uh, online transactions. Again, no, no brainer. You know, there is a, quite an increase in uh, an uptick in online transactions uh, going through. If you have been in the business of, uh, you know, physical uh, uh, cards, uh, be it debit or credit. Uh, due to uh, less of a physical transaction, say if in that particular jurisdiction where you're working, they don't have uh, Apple Pay or an equivalent, uh, you know, card no present transaction, so it's not a standard and people don't use that. You had a dip in your business. Um, and if you are in a, you know, credit risk management business, like all the other, you know, credit risk products, you know, right now you are just thinking how to sail through this uh, storm. Okay. Thank you, Marius. 
Um, so Nigel, uh, I understand that you were leading your first uh, startup through the dot com crash in 2000 and you were CEO of Currency Cloud uh, during 2007-2008 uh, credit crunch. So how is it going for Rails Bank so far with this crisis and what are your expectations uh, going further? Sure, as it, yeah, as it says, it's a, it's a crisis and uh, <clears throat> I think we still have still very uncertain outcomes to to what the future looks like at this moment in time. Uh, so, uh, I think one of the things we we I think we're quite lucky in Rails Bank is that my co-founder, myself, my CTO, our chief architect, uh, all went through those uh, markets together. My chief architect was a CTO of Currency Cloud, original CTO there as well, and my. Uh, uh, my CFO went through Credit Crunch when he was a CEO of a quite major hedge fund and was on the front page of the FT uh, for five days in a row uh, because of uh, they were the longest holder of Northern Rock at the time. So the one the learnings from all of us, and it's not just, just myself, it's, it's the whole team, is uh, you've got to take action super quick. Uh, and those measures you take super quick uh, generally involve cost control is your first one to see what levers you have to control over your cost uh, and and basically uh, anything that's nice to have has to go and start from a baseline of uh, of uh, what is the bare minimum uh, the bare bones that you need to operate uh, number two is uh, the general playbook in on down markets uh, they learned this the through having two really decent customers in 1990 or in 2000 sorry uh, from 1996 when we found the company was Goldman Sachs and, and UBS and they at the time just said cut your prices and we'll survive to this together and they uh, and we did we survived and we sold the, we took the tail end of 2003 when the markets went up again and we sold the company in 2006 so the the key thing is customers and refocusing uh, really on your, your customers your the people who you've already signed up and making them as happy as possible and helping and guiding them through these markets too because they're going to be having uh, a bad time as well and their customer their customers on the end of our customers because we have consumers and smes as a uh, who our customers uh, are service and we've got some 800,000 of them uh, you you have to think in their end uh, customer shoes how can we help everybody in the whole ecosystem work uh, correctly? So there's lots of conversations we're having on, on the sort of stress testing of customers, on seeing what we can help. Uh, we're introducing our investor base uh, and other investor network to people to ensure they're capitalized. So the focus on customers. And then it's on, uh, do you have a plan and have enough capital? Uh, the reason for controlling cost early is there's two loads of companies get into this death spiral of I think it'll be good uh, and then it isn't good <laughs> so because the markets continue going down it's like when you first try to start trading and think yeah the, the stock will get better the stock will get better it never does uh, so you you need to control it and have enough capital and uh, and uh, control over your cost to say give you a 12 to 24 month runway the reason I say 24 months, if you look at the S&Ps down to like 30 odd percent, these, uh, the FTSE's down 32% since uh, December 31st. Uh, those metrics, if you look with, uh, there's a, a very uh, flamboyant analyst called Frank Quattrioni, who's the end of dot com boom, that has just written a paper last week on this, the points to a two year recovery. So I, I don't think it's a short term personally either. So plan to get enough cash and work with the customers to get the revenues coming in uh, to, to get down this. Thank you, Nigel. So definitely seems like you have a lot of experience and hopefully that will help you to survive the current crisis uh, with Rails Bank. So the next question is for Leslie. Uh, so I understand you're based in San Francisco. Uh, your headquarters uh, of Revel Systems is at, in Atlanta, and you also have a large office in Lithuania. So your company is used to uh, remote communication, but how has it been so far adapting to the totally remote work, and how is Revel Systems uh, coping with the, with the crisis? 
Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Uh, obviously, being a global company, we have offices in North America, Europe, and in Asia Pacific, uh, and we're used to traditionally working out of out of an office space and being able to, in a very quick time period, being able to dispatch our entire company remotely, obviously, is a challenge. Uh, as we were talking about in the pre-conversation, it's been very interesting, though. I, I do believe our productivity is up as a whole. Um, you know, I think people, you know, when we talk about introverts and extroverts, some people are way more focused now, while others uh, may be struggling with the times, you know, by themselves at, at their at their homes. Uh, but overall, you know, we're we've really embraced video technology. You know, we've always been a company that's that's used a lot of technology to be able to gather and group and meet. However, now it's 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 forced upon us. Um, being able to take our entire support organization and and put that at, put them at home, um, I was very impressed. Uh, you know, they were able to dispatch very quickly. Within forty eight hours, we had everyone remote um, and at home and supporting our customer base. I absolutely agree with what Nigel said about the three C's, controlling costs, having enough capital, and really for us also focusing on customers and figuring out how to bridge this path. This is something none of us, we, we, we saw the dot com and we saw 2008 and we saw, you know, those recessions that we all had to deal with and move forward, but we've never seen anything like this. And, and so, you know, right now our focus is on our employees, our focus is on our customers to ensure that we've got the right path to sustain. All right, thank you, Leslie. Um, so just a quick reminder to everybody who is listening, uh, don't be shy. You have this great opportunity to ask our speakers the questions uh, that are in your minds. So just post the question in Q&A tab and we'll come back to those questions and try to answer. Marius, I see you have something to add, please. Yeah, I had a question to the panelists. Uh, you know, maybe we can share, you know, our understanding what type of state of the world are we and uh, what is the immediate future? Uh, how does it look from the perspective of San Francisco or, or London? Yeah, from, from, a, from a San Francisco and, and US perspective, um, I think it's like the rest of us. I think it's, it's very unknown, you know, and, and handling this at 30 day clips is, is very interesting. You know, we, we've extended our social distancing from a country level till April 30th. However, we do handle things on a state by state basis as well. So <clears throat> it is very interesting to sit and, and watch um, from, a, from a US perspective, everything we're doing, and then looking to see what our counterparts are doing in other parts of the globe. Um, again, I, I think this is very uncharted territories and it's our responsibility to, to do the best we can for our employees and our customers but listen to the medical professionals that are speaking to us about really how we get through this. You know, the financial situation, obviously super important for all of us. We run companies and businesses, um, you know, but looking at how to put health and safety first while still moving our, our businesses forward. Yes, uh, uh, I sort of give a perspective, we're based in London, Lithuania and Southeast Asia, uh, and also in Southeast Asia, Singapore, Vietnam and, and Sri Lanka. The the interesting thing was the, we sent people home super early uh, in Singapore uh, as soon as the the uh, orange alert was was announced there, and we have several of the team members are mainland Chinese in London, and so when they came back, uh, the uh, we we quarantined them and some interns who were over from Singapore. And one of the learnings there early on was. Uh, to, uh, uh, to some of our kit needed to be upgraded, some of the hardware to be able to work remotely, uh, and especially on operations staff who are doing all the SWIFT uh, payments and settlements and stuff. So that sort of gave us a bit of, okay, we've been thinking through uh, and were able to uh, uh, quite seamlessly deploy the whole company uh, at home uh, when we sent the London office home and uh to to uh to to operate from home and, and it's because we were a cloud native uh, business and just by chance two weeks beforehand we'd run a whole business continuity test uh which is thanks to my co-founder and our head of ops uh which has sent the whole pretty operate from different sites and you have to take your kit with you so that that was a good thing we, we, we're proud to say we didn't impact any, any customers the sort of outlook uh <laughs> 
is uh, so I'm, I'm I'm actually holed up at, at, in the south of France where, where I, I live. Uh, I live between, here in Singapore, and other colleagues around all around the world in Lithuania, in and all over the UK, and other parts of Europe and and uh, Singapore. Uh, the uh, some of the the sort of weird things have happened. We've had one pair of headphones eaten by a dog. Uh, we've had one pair of headphones eaten by a rabbit. <laughs> so it's uh, the the unintended consequences of pets and technology uh, is one. Uh, but it's trying to get people talking and socialising. The, the human impact is is quite huge, as as uh, as Leslie mentioned earlier, the different types of personality. So we try and have a coffee, a virtual coffee each morning, uh, leadership team. Uh, I think we had virtual beers on Friday night. And uh, the, we're sort of pushing Google Hangouts to, to, to the limits on, on socialising en masse because it comes a bit chaotic uh, as well. So, Leslie. Yeah, it's funny, Nigel, that you brought that up. So we've, um, and it's actually, they've spearheaded, a lot of our competitions have spearheaded out of our Lithuania office. So we did a home office contest who had the coolest home office um, doing virtual coffee. Um, there's sign up sheet for different virtual coffee sessions that are going on. Um, definitely the virtual happy hour, I will tell you in the US is, is very popular, the virtual happy hour. Um, you know, and as a leader, I think it's really important that we participate and jump into that stuff too. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're very busy looking at, at all the ways that, you know, we're going to sustain through the long haul of this. Cause I agree with what you said before about what we're seeing, having that 12 to 24 month plan, I think is the right way to take it right now. Um, and so I still make sure that I pop into these, these virtual events and, and let everyone know that, you know, while we're doing a lot of stuff, I think it's important that everyone sees that we're taking that moment to spend the time, you know, time with our teams. Again, when we look at the different generations, of workers, you know, for our millennial workforce, they've never seen a recession economy. And, and so, you know, making sure that we're walking through that, hey, this has happened before. And while it's tricky waters, we will survive this. Um, but we're going to do and operate in a different capacity in a different way. And I think that communication is also important to help, you know, none of us can do any guarantees right now, but trying to have that calming message, I think is super important. Thank you, Leslie. Indeed, what Nigel and Leslie have mentioned, the same at Invest Lithuania, we're doing morning coffees and I think it's very important for us, for all of us, still feel as part of the organization, still feel part of the team, although we're alone in the home stack between four walls. So finally, thank you very much. We have some very interesting questions for our panelists. So I would like to take the first question uh, to Myris uh, as it's directed to a regulator. So we also seen that uh, many of the banks around the world are now increasing the limits for contactless payments, including Lithuania. We see that central banks are reducing capital re uh, adequacy requirements for credit institutions and reducing um, re uh, liquidity reserves in order to the sustain economy. And also our viewer has asked, so what's the role of the financial regulator in the current situation and perhaps what other measures that the regulators could take to, to improve mm. the situation? Yes, uh, right, uh, 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 like straight to the point question, but uh, in the interest of time, let me just summarize it by, by one uh, phrase. We are giving breathing space in terms of time, in terms of uh, reports, in terms of uh, prudential and other requirements. Of course, we're not cutting uh, loose <laughs> everything, but uh, we do understand that uh, uh, unstandard situations uh, require unstandard policy actions. Uh, and I think the, the question also asked uh, how, how the regulators uh, can support innovation still taking place um, under these circumstances and what, what do we do in that space? Well, I guess we have to lead by example and uh, if there's one thing I can share, which is uh, not confidential, is uh, that you know, uh, global regulators um, are considering that doing teleconferences might not be a, a good thing, and we may, may be switching to some more advanced uh, technology. And I just cannot name the exact uh, name of that technology for cybersecurity reasons, but it will not be a, just a phone call, which it used to be all the time. All right. Thank you, Maris. Um, 
So I have a question then for Nigel. Uh, so in this current situation, uh, consumer need for digital banking services is increasing, which is forcing a lot of uh, traditional financial institutions to fast track their digital innovations. Uh, how do you think this might shift the cooperation versus uh, competition paradigm among some of the incumbent financial institutions and fintechs. So Rails Bank is active in Asia and in Europe. Uh, what changes do you expect in these regions? It's a, it's a good question. Uh, uh, just to clarify, we, we don't do direct to consumer or direct to SME. We, we are the infrastructure sort of bank behind uh, uh, near banks who do, do exactly that. I think one of the advantages uh, you have with uh, having a more lightweight infrastructure, as in your brand new uh, financial institution, uh, you're able to take a ton of cost out of it. So uh, you don't have some of the handcuffs you'd ordinarily have uh, with, uh, with legacy. And so your digital infrastructure, while the app may look the same uh, to the customer, because to, to be frank, most apps are pretty much the same in terms of functionality and things. And please don't take that the wrong way. Anybody's in the in the uh, near banking world, but uh, the 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 cost the fact is you can be uh, you, significantly less cost based behind that, and you can pass that on to your customers as well, which is a good thing. And you have less requirements on the on the regulator in terms of capital adequacy and things. So that's one thing. Uh, support. Uh, this is one thing which uh, digitally native businesses get so much work, so much better. They understand the nature of supporting customers through digital channels. Uh, and it's not just having an email address or support center, et cetera. It's having something that's uh, responsive uh, to customers and answers the questions they ask uh, rather than stock questions. And I, I tend to find the, the neobanks have that more supporting culture an open culture than you'd find in traditional. So I think the challenge for your traditional banks is one cost base in, in this environment uh, because uh, revenues are going to de decrease and people aren't, uh, loans are going to default and there's a whole load of issues. And it's going to put significant stress on, on uh, especially in economies like Spain, uh, and Italy, for example, and to be honest, uh, and Greece uh, as well. Uh, whereas the, 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 the neobanks have a, have less of a, an issue because they haven't really got into lending. Uh, so they can still service the day-to-day cash-based needs or, of uh, the consumer base. So I, I don't think it's really a, a, a too much a legacy versus neobank thing. I think because they've evolved in different ways, they're going to have different challenges uh, from that. I'd say in the neobanking world, uh, a classic example going all the way back to 2007, 2008, one of our investors was deputy CEO of uh, HSBC. And in 2008, uh, the uh, deposits of HSBC rocketed. So as a neo, as a neo bank, you don't have that trust uh, of 100 years of banking that you'd have in, say, Barclays and others. So if you're a traditional bank, your, your deposits will be going up because they, they're very, there's a few of them, put Lehman's aside, but people at Barclays haven't defaulted, HSBC hasn't defaulted, DBS hasn't supported uh, and things. JP Morgan's a massively strong bank. Uh, so the capital will fly to, to safety uh, as well. So that's a challenge for for attracting new customers to neobanks. So I think that the, they've both got challenges ahead. Uh, and they're both going to advance and they'll both survive, I think, because they survived through the uh, the credit crunch side in Western world anyway. So uh, the I can't really, I don't think anyone's got a particular advantage at the moment. Okay, thank you very much, Nigel. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, so our viewer is interested uh, whether your companies have applied some kind of stress testing models in your business. And if yes, how it relates to the current situation, or maybe you applied some risk management plan and so on. Yeah, if, yes, uh, the, the, uh, my, uh, I sit on the board of a hedge fund as well, and have come from that, so that sort of sorry, capital markets part of the world. Uh, and most of our management team are well ex capital markets. So we understand risk management and, and do that. So the short answer is yes, we have. Uh, we're, advancing, we're advising our customers to stress test as well. And that's stress testing, for example, uh, if you're looking at your, uh, your forward revenue lines, uh, we're running tests like uh, revenue decline over every month for the next uh, 12 months 
uh, zero customer growth, uh, a small revenue growth, uh, and and our original plan, which is now been uh, been parked for a little while. <laughs> but uh, so yes, it is a on the revenue side, cost side, all of that needs stress testing uh, to uh, to give you scenarios. And why like everything is uh, once a model's written, it is wrong, and the plan's written, it's wrong the moment it's written. But it gives you the scenario that you can think through and you've pre-done the numbers so they're in your head. And you think, oh, the minus five plan is this. So if I'm thinking it this way, okay, that I've seen that that event, and that event means we may have to take action because it's on the it's one of the conditions of the minus five plan. If the business as usual plan is there and the optimistic one, hey, that, that's good. That means we can invest a bit somewhere else. So it's really get your scenarios, and your scenarios give you uh, tells and your numbers pre-thought. They won't give you the answer, but they'll help you think quick. And coming back to the original question you asked, it is about a think quick environment and make action quick. Don't sit on things. Sense of urgency. And the tough decisions have to be made, and you have to make tough decisions with a sense of dignity as well to your, to your teams and your customers because sometimes you have to make hard calls. On it. So stress testing is super important, really from a scenario perspective to summary uh, answer that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nigel. Leslie, from Rebel Systems perspective, the same question. Did you, have you done any crisis uh, planning and so on? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I echo exactly what Nigel just said. I, I think that that's exactly right. You know, acting swiftly, you know, Nigel said it when we first kicked off, which is really about looking at some worst case scenarios, you know, and planning more towards towards that, but being able to shift your model, right? So we're absolutely doing that. You know, we meet regularly to go through what our models are. Obviously, just starting 2020, we had very different models eight weeks ago um, than we do today. And, and obviously, <clears throat> in our business, we're a point of sale software company, and we are very dependent on retail and restaurants. And, and obviously we all know besides our frontline, you know, health workers and, and law enforcement, um, that industry has been hit the hardest thus far. Uh, and so that's exactly what we're trying to do. And, and we're trying, very proud of our company. You know, again, we, our mantra is to be the people point of sale. And so we put forth a, a, a what we're calling the Rebel Relief Program, where we're trying to help our customers who are single site brick and mortar, you know, restaurants and multi-site restaurants that, that just are very uncertain times. So we're trying our best to make sure that we're doing the right model for our business, but also trying to help a market that's really struggling. Um, you know, and we, we look at it from a payment side as well as <clears throat> we do offer payments and contactless is critical, you know, right now. And, and so these restaurants have had to pivot um, their business models completely. You know, we have table service restaurants that never once thought about doing any sort of takeaway or delivery and now working with us as quickly as possible to set up that model so they can at least get some cash revenue in the door. So I think it's, while it's equally important that we're putting together our models, um, helping our customers for them to forecast and put together their models as well. Um, again, looking at this as a team sport and how we all come out of this, you know, together. Right. I can give you an, another perspective on uh, stress testing from a different angle. Uh, we, you know, all institutions do some kind of stress testing, especially ones the ones that have some prudential requirements, you know, to maintain their, you know, healthy capital base. And uh, those that are doing a complicated internal ratings-based modeling are approaching regulators and saying, hey, guys, how do we treat this uh, blip in the data, you know? Uh, to ensure that it doesn't stick in the data so that next time it will be doing stress testing, it doesn't show up. Uh, it's a bit weird, right? It's uh, what we as macroeconomists also have done. You know, when we look at macro series, and be it the GDP, you know, consumption, whatever, we go as, as long as until uh, 1945. Because, you know, Second World War was something that shouldn't be in the modeling data where we draw our you know, risk uh, shock from. So I think that uh, it, it really shows that even stress testing as such uh, will be changing conceptually, that events like these, you know, these fat tail distributions will become, uh, you know, a, a toolbox for risk modeling and stress testing. 
Indeed, that's that's for sure. Uh, so Marius, then since you're uh, talking now, I will uh, have another question for you. So we see that this crisis is affecting all the sectors and uh, a lot of people are already talking that small and medium enterprises especially will be very much affected and many of them are already uh, trying to get support from the government and the others are trying to get loans from the banks which is not always easy do you think that in this this conditions fintechs could be the ones that with accessible approach and flexible ap approach to lending uh, make the, the situation better for some of the small and medium enterprises? Uh, I don't know the answer for sure. Uh, you know, let me say that upfront. But it looks natural that uh, if, uh, if a government tells you that you have to shut down your, you know, brick and mortar bank uh, or, you know, just any establishment you have, your physical contact with customers is uh, really down to nothing. If you do not have a remote uh, identification or remote onboarding of customers uh, already in place uh, you will be struggling so maybe here you know thankfully at least in this jurisdiction we really made a you know a decision to to enable that and uh, many of uh, regulated firms operating in uh, in lithuania have benefited uh, because of that so they can still provide services, they can still contact with their customers, they can still sign contracts utilizing digital signatures and so on. So at least from financial perspective, if there is a need for a financial transaction, it can still go through. What we, uh, what we really also are seeing that um, uh, the big players, you know, the big guys on the block, uh, they are looking at the balance sheet, you know, the probably soon to be distressed part of the balance sheet, and they really don't want to engage with the new guys, uh, the small and medium enterprise firms, majority of whom did not have any credit relationships with the big guys before, because it's a small, you know, corner shop. You know, they, they, you know, they have been operating on a cash flow basis, and all of a sudden the cash flow is stuck, and they, you know, would like to utilize the the schemes, the guarantees uh, being provided all over the world right now. But how do you approach the, the big guy on the block? The, the bank branch is closed. They have no onboarding online. So the only opportunity is uh, these new players. So from that perspective, uh, I think uh, there's, it's an opportunity. But also from another perspective, you know, how do you handle the, the funding side element of such a type of business, especially in a situation where cash is king? So I'm not doing any predictions, uh, which I shouldn't. Uh, but it's definitely an interesting situation. And it's, once again, very uncertain, even in, in this particular uh, angle. Thank you, Maris. And uh, how do you see, in the broader view, venture capital investments uh, going further 6 to 12 months? And that was one of the questions from our viewers. Perhaps, Nigel, uh, you would like to Ooh. answer that. Uh, uh, the there's quite a lot of debate on this, and uh, the uh, on the news feeds, uh, blogosphere, and Twitter, and everything. Uh, the our observations are uh, we're seeing uh, term sheets being pulled uh, by some firms for uh, for various reasons. Uh, we're seeing LPs who are the, the funding behind the venture capital firms uh, uh, putting some weight and hold handcuffs on uh, their venture funds we're also seeing venture funds invest so uh, uh, this uh, one of our customers ellipse uh, was funded yesterday and I got their seed financing which is a great uh, great thing for them so uh, it's a combination of uh, uh, and there's a lot of venture back businesses going bust uh, we saw the the one web uh, guys unfortunately I uh, go bust recently in San Francisco uh, or I think they're in San Francisco, but the the I think uh, the the feedback we've got from talking to a ton of uh, investors because we were uh, uh, in the midst of uh, at the time was raising Series B, is uh, the the they're very much still searching for uh, robust quality of earnings business models 
sort of repeatable revenues as opposed to transactional revenues. Those businesses are, are there's uh, the discounting on pricing, but there's still strong strong revenues, uh, strong businesses to to be invested in. Uh, we're seeing LPs just just wanting to give a month's breathing space to get some data on what outcome may look may look like and what pricing may settle to so i think it's very much a is it a 10 percent discount to last year 20 30 percent uh does it follow the public markets discount uh on multiples and things so that that's on, on top of mind so there, there are people investing i think it's slightly slower this q1 of the year q2 of the year they have to deploy capital uh the capital sitting on the fund not deployed is also uh, burning a hole because it needs to be deployed. Uh, so it's not doom and gloom. I think it's sensible, uh, really know your numbers. If anybody, if anybody's raising capital at the moment, know your numbers inside out. Uh, have a very practical plan and different scenarios that can show where things turn. And very much it's, as Mario said, it's cash is king. And really f f focus on your burn rate and what you really need you to, to do. So. Uh, businesses that massively rely on on venture capital underwriting the cost of ac the, the cap the customer acquisition costs i think are a thing of the past for the next uh, 12 months or so because uh, acquiring new customers isn't really in the playbook so it's it's the money's there i think there's discounts it's more selective but the overall positive feeling is uh still investing Thank you, Nigel. Marius, uh, yeah, just I wanted to react to something which uh, Nigel said uh, that, you know, unfortunately, some of the businesses, uh, you know, the startups, you know, will be or are already going bust. And uh, going bust is nothing wrong. You know, it's part, it's part of a natural, you know, creative destruction of the way things should be working. The only thing, the only thing wrong with bankruptcy is that uh, sometimes it's uh, very costly, most of the time. 20% of the bankruptcy estate just vanishes in the fees to the lawyers and things like that. But um, the lean and digital companies, which uh, most of the fintechs are, they don't have any less tangible assets. Uh, they are much more you know, monoline institutions. And uh, maybe for them, the restructuring process uh, would be much more lighter. And therefore, you know, this more difficult uh, part of the near future will be dealt with them um, in, in a much more straightforward fashion. We'll see more, not only bankruptcies, but M&As, uh, where companies acquire each other, where we see synergies all of a sudden, be, be, and you know, before they saw each other as rivals, now we'll see some synergies. And uh, maybe things will turn out to, to even a better outcome because you know, they'll be pushed into more efficiency and, and all the other things. So in the current situation, what do you think will happen with the fintech valuations? I don't know if... Mike, I can... Yes, sir. I can I, I'll tell you a, a general theory that which I, you know, is, it has been haunting me for the last two weeks. You know, regardless of what type of, you know, discounted cash flow model you have in your mind, you know, asset pricing, uh, uh, simple form or uh, whatever, you know, you have some risk factors which you use to price your assets, liabilities, business, stocks, whatever. And now, all of a sudden, the whole world realizes that there is a, this new risk factor which tells you that it's not a theoretical probability, it's actual probability that at some point in time, and it could happen another, like after five years, after five months, all world will stand still. Now, put that risk factor into your pricing model of assets, of venture capital, what do, you, what do you find? All valuations will go down. So this is a huge wealth effect which we're experiencing right now, which you see in the stock market, which you see in really you know, the uncertainty of how to value things. And uh, yeah, the thing, thing applies now to all valuation models right now. Nigel? Just following on from Mary said that uh, in, there's been a long overdue asset revaluation, uh, which uh, the uh, the markets or guys the hedge fund world and other investors have been predicting. It's either sometime over the next three years, okay, uh, and that's as, as accurate. Anybody who says they got it spot on is lying or very lucky. Uh, and the uh, and the concept of black swans, uh, they do appear. Uh, there's a guy called Nick Taleb, who's a legendary uh, put option trader who sells 
uh, doom and gloom all around the world makes a ton of premiums on that and then every time doom and gloom comes along he, he makes a big bonus uh, so uh, those things uh, and uh, with grey hair it helps have gone through those revaluation uh, moments of, of the world of Russian default LTCM going bust credit crunch dot com bust all, all those different events uh, and the so asset revaluation is here. Uh, this uh, coronavirus situation has just accelerated a long overdue asset revaluation. So, and that will just bring values down in in companies. So, they're probably uh, there'll be uh, I think well valued companies because uh, quality of earnings will still uh, be, be command a premium, even a low earning a low valuation environment. Uh, and venture capital. Depending on the stage you are, uh, the uh, the uh, seed and angel. It's about the team. They don't really care about your plan because it's wrong, and will be a hundred percent wrong. And the whole uh, thing between series, between seed and to uh, series C and D and to the public markets is by the time you're at the public markets, you're probably eighty percent right, and that's why you get a premium on the stock, and that's why you get a high valuation. And so your journey is on. Uh, from 100% wrong to 80% right uh, as you go along. And when you're an entrepreneur and realize that, uh, and you realize prices are down, that journey hasn't changed, if you see what I mean. And, uh, and I, but I do think uh, valuations will be uh, uh, quality of earnings, that means repeatability and solidity of them, uh, and people are buying market and uh, using venture capital fund to, to underwrite uh, the buying of customers. Uh, because the it's the only way they get them uh, is going to have massive uh, valuation downfall on it. Thank you, Nigel. Um, so coming back more to a customer side of it, uh, Leslie. So in, in your business, uh, you already mentioned restaurants and uh, retail shops. They are all being closed, but on the other hand, food delivery, grocery deliveries is booming. And, and your company is adapting to the changing situation. And also one of our viewers is asking, so what are the practical ways to support your customers that are struggling now? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, when we're as a, as a software company, you look at your, you look at your roadmap, you know, 12 months out on what you're developing. Uh, and we had a pretty solid roadmap coming into Q1. Um, that roadmap is shifting, right? So where we were previously looking at how to maybe do certain technologies a different way. Now we're shifting completely to the online ordering, drive-through, delivery management, um, and working with our customers to figure out how to shift their business from being a brick and mortar that is all required with people coming in and, and being in that restaurant to being able to do, to do the takeaway, um, but being able to enable the technology swiftly I think is what is most critical right now for the customer base. When you're talking about restaurant groups, you know, you're not talking about high margin business where they have a lot of cash flow and, and cash reserves to sit back, right? They've got a lot of, they've got a lot of upfront costs with real estate, with people and with supply chain management. And so for us to figure out ways to make that a less stress point for them to be able to shift and pivot. Like I said, we have a customer in Miami, Florida, that's been a table service restaurant their whole lives. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden we get a phone call from them that says, hey, we wanna, we've never thought about delivery. We've never thought about um, online ordering. Um, how do we shift and how do we pivot? And that's where it's critical for us to be able to be available. You know, so when we started the call and we talked about how swiftly we were able to dispatch our employees all over, you know, in Lithuania and Vilnius, We've got over 180 employees and being from development to support to back office and all of those things, being able to get them prepared, you know, to take these calls. I, I would say right now, one of the big things that we're pushing to is, is empathy, right? I mean, you're talking about businesses that literally have no idea what they're doing and what they're going to do to survive this. Um, and so one of the things that we've really had to look forward is, is how do we help, how do we help these customers? You know, there's government programs all over the mm -hmm. world that are that are taking place, but they're not taking place as quickly as we all think that they are. So that's what we're doing behind the scenes is how do we help? How do we deploy technology? How do we grow and enable our technology? Because this is going to be the trend for quite a few months. 
you know, there's going to be a backlash of this. It's not something that as soon as the, as soon as, you know, a few moments ago, we were talking about the banking industry and people brick and mortar being able to go in. It's very similar in the restaurant. We don't know what that tail is going to be on how long before people feel comfortable going back into, you know, a restaurant, a bar setting. So that that's, we customer first employees, how do we enable better technology and faster for, for these guys? Mm -hmm. uh, Leslie, so on the same topic, uh, I have another question for you, actually, it's from uh, one of the viewers, Mauro. So after the financial crisis, fintechs emerged to provide more transparent services and a more enjoyable customer experience to consumers. Uh, what will they learn from this COVID crisis? Yeah, I think, um, God, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that it's, it's, we're learning day by day. I would say is, is probably the biggest piece. Um, and I think what businesses in the hospitality space are going to have to learn is how do you differentiate? So you aren't stuck into one path. You know, how can, how can you, if we have something like this again, which I hope we never do, um, how do you shift more in a faster fashion? How do we react more in an agile way? Um, I think there's a lot of, again, going back to what we talked about before, you know, a lot of things in the, in the hospitality space is really around cost control. I think that's going to be an area where we have to really help and enable is getting even better around inventory management, payroll management, so that we run a more lean business at, in the hospitality space. I think that's, they always run very lean anyway, um, but even, even being more lean, but looking how to, how to differentiate you know, their, their business model. So it's not kind of this one and done scenario. Uh, and I think that's tricky. I think that's tricky in the hospitality space. And, and I would say that it's probably, it's probably tricky between brick and mortar banking and electronic, you know, fintech type style. So, you know, I would probably throw that over to Marius and Nigel as well, because I think their verticals are a little bit different, but it's the same. We, we're all having to figure out how to pivot and, and keep those guys successful. Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. Um, so uh, the time is running out. So I've selected the last two questions, one for Marius and one for Nigel. So Nigel, for you is one of the one question from our uh, viewers, Jonathan. So the question is, uh, knowing that currently all cash payments are disallowed due to obviously hygiene reasons, and there is a big rise over the past years with so speak digital banks such as Revolut uh, and and. Uh, and, and the others. Now, uh, how relevant uh, will traditional banking be in the future? And will this current situation give our Western world an opportunity to catch up with mobile and digital banking as it is known in China and Asia? What is your predictions? Uh, sure, it's, it's, it's again difficult to predict uh, uh, the China situation. Uh, so like uh, WeChat Pay, been rolled out uh, was super simple because there was no infrastructure and so they just rolled it out so there wasn't any acquiring uh, issuing uh, infrastructure like you had a visa mastercard so i think the 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 challenge is the there's embedded infrastructure in in western markets uh which is essentially visa mastercard and amex to some extent and uh it is uh in, taking that infrastructure to contactless, uh, to uh, token-based, so Apple Pay, GPay, and, and those things. So there, there will naturally be an acceleration of that. Uh, and uh, it depends whether also governments are supporting it and the cost infrastructure possibly needs to change. WeChat Pay, it's massively low cost compared to acquiring in, uh, in the Western world. So there's a, the economic side, but yes, it, there's, a, there's a general curve anyway. Uh, this may accelerate it a bit, but uh, it, it's uh, I, I just coming back to the the other point. Uh, just a moment, that Leslie answered on uh, uh, on fintech. Fintech movement was sort of named in Q1 2012, and that was uh, again a Wells Bank. We put Transwise in business. We put uh, a whole ton of these guys uh, behind us, even Revolut when they first started, and the uh, the key thing there wasn't so much about coronavirus deriving something it was a backlash against uh, being uh, upset with the banking industry because uh, they had totally disregarded the consumer so it's a very fundamental different thing of how fintech was driven out in 2007 to that is a total backlash of total loss of trust 
of the of the of the of the banking world and that's what created the fintech world was that uh, consumer i'm going to try something else because it can't be as bad as losing all my money that was up in aib for example Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, so, Marius, as we're talking about moving to digital economy completely, there's this question of uh, part of population which is not, uh, which is unbanked or elderly uh, population part, which are not used to, to digital services. Uh, are there any initiatives taken by uh, by banks or by by governments to decrease that gap and also at the same time ensure that um, with all the daily financial operations moving online that uh, avoiding fraudulent situation or cybersecurity attacks, what will be done from 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 your side? Definitely, you know, we in this particular difficult time we all always have to remember that not. All of us are so fortunate, you know, to be sitting in comfortable rooms and, and do doing uh, Zoom sessions. You know, some of our members of the society, you know, are struggling to go by the day because they have been relying on state support, or their children have been, you know, going to school. We have been, you know, getting subsidized food, uh, and all of a sudden they are not getting that, and uh, the support is not reaching uh, that part of the population uh, as quick as we would like to. And you mentioned the elderly and not being able to use the technology. Yes, and you know we always you know have been relying on this other fallback option, which is uh, cash payments or or just delivering uh, you know pension payments uh, to those uh, individuals uh, in cash form. Uh, and now with uh, physical contact uh, being limited and you know social distancing, uh, this part of the population uh, might be. In a more difficult situation. So, what the banking community has been doing, in, at least in Lithuania, they are really rolling out this campaign uh, on uh, telebanking. You can say again, falling back on some other old technology which a uh, very broad part of the population has access to, but uh, which is susceptible to cybersecurity risks and uh, fraud. Uh, again, the other thing that you mentioned. And then again, the regulators are stepping in. And the sending warnings and reminders of, uh, you know, hygiene, not only to wash your hands, but how do you treat uh, prank callers uh, who are trying to entice uh, uh, security codes from you and pretend uh, that they are your bank. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Marius. And on the same topic, uh, a small sub question uh, from also our listeners. So how do you think the will COVID contribute to reveal and uh, to perhaps to decrease at least some small part of shadow economy? I guess that's the question. <laughs> Sorry, Marius, please go. Yeah. Usually during uh, uh, economic downturns, uh, shadow economy picks up. You know, there's a very natural answer why is that the case. Everyone is trying to save on uh, cash outflows, and the biggest cash outflow for business is, ta is taxes. So if you can tuck under the table, you know, you might survive, and therefore some of uh, our members of the society are taking that risk uh, to survive, which is, seems very natural. Nigel, some small last remark on the topic? I was going to make the same point as Marius. Uh, the, <laughs> when, you know, when you put people in a corner uh, through no fault of their own, uh, people, there'll be there'll be unintended consequences, uh, and just realise it, it it's going to happen. And I think governments and regulators and uh, people are, are smart enough to realise that. All right, thank you very much, Nigel. So thank you, our dear speakers. We really appreciate your expertise and your time. Uh, thank you to everyone who have joined to listen to our discussion today. We really hope you found it interesting and, and useful. Uh, if you feel that we didn't answer some of your questions and we didn't because you were very active, uh, feel free to contact us after uh, at the end of the session in the couple of minutes you will see the slide with the QR code uh, to our contact details so just drop us a line and we'll try to answer uh, or pass that question to our speakers also if you feel like you enjoyed this webinar and you would like to follow uh, further webinars or news from us don't forget to subscribe there's also going to be a QR code at the end of the session so please stay tuned 
So let's hope that the uh, coronavirus outbreak will be controlled and soon we'll be able to come back to normal lives. Um, and let's hope that not only fintech, but also other sectors, uh, public sector, will learn to adapt to this changing conditions. In the meantime, uh, stay home, uh, stay safe, and take care. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.